Hello everybody! Before we continue on with this presentation, I would just like to say that I forgot to say my usual intro. I don't know who I am, I don't know who I think I am, and I don't know why I didn't do it. So I'm just going to say now, hi, welcome back, it's Tiny Tasha, or you can call me Tasha, like everyone else does. Okay, let's carry on. It is Christmas! Yay! Do you like my Christmassy-ness? This is literally as Christmassy as I can get at this point. I put the tree here so you can see it. Yes, we are back. Serial Killer Sunday. Hi. This is going to be the last, I think, the last video I'm going to be doing until Christmas. This Serial Killer Sunday is about Des Nielsen. Now, this guy, he fascinates me. The reason I want to talk about him is because I watched on ITV Hub last week. It's been out for a while, but I'm a bit late to the party. Um, the Des Nielsen documentary called Des. You can actually get this on BritBox, I believe. And it's just basically a, a sort of document series vibe where they basically talk about Des Nielsen and he is played by David Tennant. And I cannot believe how much David Tennant looks like Des Nielsen and he absolutely nails this role because he's Scottish as well so the accent, like the hair, the glasses, everything is just spot on, like he looks fantastic so it was only three episodes I think but it was absolutely incredible and I highly recommend if you find today's story interesting and you want to sort of get a little bit more from it, I highly recommend you watch that. I'll leave the link below in my sources, part of my bio. But I'm just gonna basically crack on, and as always, I like to talk about his um, childhood and his early years, and a lot happened to Des um, before the killing started. So I think this one's gonna be a bit of a long one, but buckle your seatbelts because it's a bloody good story and it's fascinating. But as always, there is a warning on this video. Some viewers may find the following content highly disturbing and controversial. Viewers discretion is advised. This one guys, if you're not really up to like gore and I mean it's not really gory, it's if you if you if you're a bit squeamish about things, this might not be the video for you, but I will warn you when things start to get a bit gruesome if you just want to fast forward, but I promise it's a good one. I'm just gonna get started. Okay, so Dennis Andrew Nielsen. He was born on the 23rd of November 1940 and he lived in Scotland in Fraserburg, Aberdeenshire. He lived with his mum and his dad and he had two siblings. So he had a little sister and he had a big brother. His brother was called Olav Jr, named after his father and he had a little sister called Sylvia. Des's father was a Norwegian soldier and he had travelled to Scotland in the 1940s. He was a part of the Free Norwegian Forces and that was following the German occupation of Norway so he basically got out at a good time. He swiftly, after moving to Scotland, he then ended up marrying Dennis's mother called Elizabeth. They met and married within two years of him even moving there so it was all very quick. Dennis's father, Olav, didn't really find the whole married life his sort of shindig. He didn't take it very seriously. He didn't spend much time with his wife and uh, his kids, and he just spent a lot of time working. Swiftly after the birth of Sylvia, their youngest daughter, Elizabeth decided that she wanted to get a divorce. She wasn't happy, so she was like, see ya. Um, she just completely regretted getting married to him so quickly in the first place. He obviously wasn't a family man or even interested in her, so she got out. She then decided to move back home with her parents and they fully supported the divorce. They actually really did not like Olav at all and they didn't think he was the right match for her anyway, so they were pretty chuffed. And I can imagine, I mean, I don't know, they were a bit told you so about it as parents are when they know they're right. The couple divorced in 1948. So Elizabeth's parents, Andrew and Lily White, ended up becoming a real important figure in not only Elizabeth's life, but also the grandchildren. And they pretty much 
became inseparable with them. So Des was described as a very adventurous child and despite only being five years old, his earliest childhood memory is going for picnics and um, getting piggybacks from his granddad. And he actually remembers that from the age of five. So he's, his grandfather seemed to have been a massive part of his life. So Des also then describes this part of his life as the stage where he has the most fond and happy memories and he said that his grandfather was his great hero and his protector. Desi's granddad was a fisherman as a job and he continued that job until he unfortunately passed away from a heart attack at the age of 62 and Des would always say that when his grandfather would go out to work, life would be empty until he returned. So you can imagine losing a, a grandfather when you're that close to him. It was obviously extremely difficult on Des. Des's grandfather's body returned back to the family home as it did in those days and they had like an open casket coffin. Des also says that this is probably one of the most poignant and like vivid memories he has of his childhood is his grandfather passing away. He remembers literally like it was yesterday his mother coming into his room and saying do you want to see your granddad at the open casket. He said as he gazed upon his grandfather's body his mum told him that he was sleeping and that he'd gone to a better place and he thinks that this is the first time he ever looked upon death and where his concept around death had come from from seeing his granddad asleep in that coffin so as Des grew older he started to resent his family and he ended up really pushing away from them all he thought his family his mum especially favoritized his brother and his sister over him and he just started to draw away and he felt he needed to get out. He was way closer to his younger sister Sylvia than he was to anyone in the rest of his family. She was the only one he would talk to and play games with and he sort of ignored everyone else and sort of stayed out of the way. Des started to get into his teens. His family moved to Strichen. I want to say. It's a small village outside Aberdeen in Scotland um, and they moved there in 1955. So as Des started to hit puberty he realised he was gay but because this is the 1950s you can imagine how unnerving and uncomfortable that must have been for him feeling there was something wrong with him, couldn't talk to anyone about it it's shameful and as you can imagine that meant that he then kept his sexuality a secret from his brothers and sisters and his family because he didn't want to bring shame to the family and he started to realize he noticed he was attracted to men who had similar facial features that looked like his little sister Sylvia apparently on one occasion he did um, sexually fondle his little sister um, which is, you know, un uncomfortable to say that out loud, to be honest. And he was hoping that by doing that, the way he felt about these boys was because he actually had those feelings for someone who looked like his sister and that he wasn't gay and that would do the job, but he found out that that wasn't the case at all. Also, on one occasion, while his older brother was sleeping, he actually then fondled his brother as well. And um, his brother woke up and basically started calling him a hen, which is like the Scottish word for a female, and just kept basically belittling him in public and making him feel like shit. As you would, you know, you'd freak the fuck out if you were him, if that happened to you, so I understand why his brother did that. As you can tell, he was obviously very confused and didn't know who he found attractive, what was going on. So, as he got older, he then started to realise that his home life actually wasn't like his peers at school and that his family was quite poor. He was embarrassed by this and he then decided at age 14 he needed something to aim for so that he wouldn't end up like his parents and so he decided to join the uh, cadets and he was looking at, in the future joining the army. That was his goal. So Des finished school in 1961 at the age of 16, he then decided he was going to join the army and he was intending to train as a chef. Nelson passed his entry exams. Obviously, he was over the moon. He told his mum, see ya, I'm not staying here any longer. I'm getting the fuck out. And he was enlisted to serve nine years. And he then moved to the barracks in Hampshire for his training. So he was 
so excited. He basically got to start afresh. He recalls them as being the most enjoyable sort of period of his life. He really, really, you know, loved the army and the training, but he was still struggling with his sexuality and obviously being in the army wasn't, I can imagine, wasn't helping that at all. But he managed to keep his uh, sexual orientation hidden from a lot of his colleagues and he would sort of find ways around it. For example, he never showered um, at the same time as everyone else because uh, he, was, he was worried he'd like get an erection. So in mid-1964, Nielsen passed his initial exam uh, to become a chef in the army and he was assigned for the 1st Battalion of the Royal Fusiliers in West Germany where he served as a private, so he was on his way. He then ended up, because he was hiding his sexuality, he became a bit of a drunk and he ended up describing his time in the army with his colleagues hard working and were a bit of a boozy lot so there was one situation where he ended up getting extremely drunk with a german boy des woke up to find himself in the german youth's flat and by the sounds of it no sexual activity happened like des didn't remember anything but it did end up fueling his sexual fantasies and that's when it ended up becoming sort of like his thing there'd be like a a really slender young man that was completely unconscious or dead that he could then have some form of sexual pleasure out of. So this is supposedly where it all stems from. So after those two years of service he then finally officially passed his catering exam and he started to serve as a cook for the British Army in Norway 1967 and this post was slightly more dangerous than his previous ones but he was excited and he was finally a cook. And there was one situation while he was working in Norway where he got kidnapped by an Arab taxi driver and this guy beat him unconscious and locked him in the boot of his car. Once this Arab man tried to get Des out of his car, Des was able to hit him over the head and he managed to run away. So he hasn't seemed to have had the easiest time so far. After he served his time there, he then ended up coming back to Plymouth and he ended up becoming a cook there for a large number of soldiers and officers as well. And then he ended up moving round barracks to barracks for a period of time and then he ended up finishing his army service um, after 11 years. So he was in the army for a quite a long time and he finished in October 1972 at the age of 26. So between October and December of 1972, Dennis then decided to go and live with his family just while he then decided upon his next career move. And his mum's automatic concern as a mum when you have a 26 year old son is why is there like no females around like in your company like you never bring a girl home like they still don't know he's gay obviously so one occasion while he was home he was watching a documentary with his older brother Olav and his wife about gay rights and his sister-in-law and his brother were like making loads of jokes and he stood up for gay rights and sort of fought back against his brother and actually didn't go down very well at all they couldn't understand why he was standing up for these people they ended up getting into a bit of a fist fight about it and his older brother then ended up telling his mother that Dennis was gay. And with that, obviously, Dennis then decided he was never going to speak to his brother again. He didn't really end up speaking much to his mum after that either. Like, they wrote a little bit, but the relationship was never the same. So he decided uh, for a brief period of time that he was actually going to work in the Metropolitan Police. And with this, he then moved to London while he was working at the Met. So in April 1973, Des ended up completing his training as a constable in the Met and he ended up being posted at Wilsdon Green in London. So he only, in his time in the Met, actually only performed several arrests um, he, as he was only in the Met for a year. He did really enjoy it, but the reason why he left is because he missed the sort of brotherhood that he had in the army and it really wasn't the same. I don't know whether that was the reason or whether something else happened, but that's all I could find. After he quit the police, he then ended up becoming a bit of a drunk. He was going from sort of pub to pub, drinking alone in the evenings. And in summer and autumn of 1973, he began frequently visiting gay bars as well. And he would engage in several casual liaisons with men. He said 
later on that he viewed these casual situations with men quite soul destroying where he would only sort of like lend his sexual partner his body for that moment in like a vain search for inner peace like these are his words like he just wasn't quite sure why he was doing it other than making himself feel good. So Des then ended up working as a civil servant in 1974. He was initially posted at a job center where his primary role was to find employment for other people who didn't really have any like skill, so to speak. He had quite a good work ethic. He came across to people as quite normal, which I think for me is like the scary part. He was just a normal guy. He was then promoted in 1979 to the executive officer and he then had like extra authority and he was like a bit more of a supervisory vibe over other people. And then in June 1982, he transferred to another job centre in Kentish Town and he worked there until his arrest. So this is where the murder starts to take place. This is like when it starts to get seriously juicy. Are you ready? Nielsen's murders were first discovered by a plumber from a company called Dino Rod. And this guy was called Michael Catran. And he responded to a plumbing complaint where there was like blockage at his uh, blocks of flat, blocks of flats, blocks of flats where, I couldn't get that out, where Nielsen lived. And this was at a place called Cranley Gardens on the 8th of February, 1983. So when they opened the drain cover at the side of the house, the plumber had discovered packed with like a flesh-like substance and there was numerous small bones inside. Um, a couple of hours later, Des and another tenant went up to the plumber and asked him like what the situation was. And the plumber then explained about the flesh-like substance and the bones that he'd found. Des Nielsen then piped up and said, it looks like to me someone's flushed down their KFC bones from their dinner. Just like shrugging it off, like, oh, it's just KFC. Cause you know, who doesn't? shove their KFC bones down the toilet. That's common, isn't it? That's where everyone puts their rubbish down the toilet. So at 7.30 a.m. the following morning, the plumber Michael brings his boss to the scene and is basically like, boss, what, what the fuck do I do? When they got there, the bones had been cleared away. They were gone. Suspicious? I mean, who knows? Who knows? So the plumber then has a bit of a, another deep dive into the drains and see if he could find something else because the pipes were still blocked. He then ended up discovering further up the drains towards the upper flats, bones were stuck and some flesh was stuck in the pipes leaving the top flat. And when they pulled the bones out, it looked like bones from like a human hand. By that point, both men, Michael and his boss, decided that they were gonna get the police involved because something seriously suspicious is going on and they didn't want to sort of damage any evidence if that was the case. So the remains that they'd found was taken to the mortuary at Hornsley where a pathologist, Professor David Bowen, told the police that the bones were human remains and that one particular piece of flesh they found had been from a human neck and actually had a ligature mark in it. So this is when they were like, shit, this isn't just some KFC bones. This is a murder, a bit of a worry. If I, if I was them, I'd be a bit shit myself a little bit. So they then went back and like said to the plumber, okay, where do you think this has come from? He was like, the top flat. It has to have come from the top flat. And that top flat belonged to our friend Des. Of course it did. Oh shit, he'd been caught. Detective Chief Inspector Peter Jay was the guy who was on this case and he decided he was gonna wait with some police officers until Des got back from work because he wasn't home yet. So when Nielsen then returned home, Detective Inspector Jay was waiting for him. I'm just gonna call him Jay because it's just gonna be very long-winded otherwise. And they explained that they were here because they had an inquiry from the drains and the plumbing and they needed to speak to him. And Nielsen was like, well, why are the police getting involved with drains? Jay asked if they could go up to his flat. So Des was like, sure, come on up. Took him up to his flat. Well, that flat is something else. The first thing that the officers smelled when they walked into that flat was the smell of rotting flesh. Like, it was so strong. It just hit you. Like, as soon as he opened that door, it was just like, apparently disgusting. I don't know, I wasn't there. Des then asked why the police were there and were so interested in the drains and they told them that they found human flesh and bones in the drains and it was leading up to his flat. Des then said, good grief, that's awful. Jay then said, don't mess about mate, where are the rest of the bodies? We know it's from your flat, we know it's from you. 
And just like that, he calmly then admits the rest of the remaining body could be found in two plastic sacks in the nearby wardrobe. Just goes, oh god, that sounds awful. Oh yeah, yeah, you want the rest of the body, it's just over there, mate. What the fuck, this guy is absolutely crackers. The fact he was just so okay with just handing that knowledge over just baffles me. So then Jay then asks Des, while we're here, is there any other bodies we should know about? Now's your time to sort of fess up sort of thing. And then Des goes, it's a long story, it goes back a long time, I want to get it off my chest. I'll tell you everything, but not here, at the police station. Basically says, yes, you know, there are more, and I want to confess. Which is extremely weird. And you know, in past murders, they haven't just handed themselves over like that. They've usually gone down with a fight, so it was quite weird for this to happen. So he was then arrested, and he was taken to Hornsey Police Station for suspected murder. So while they were in the car, on the way to the police station. So one of the police officers then says to Des whether there was one or two people. And Des then replies, 15 or 16, since 1978. And as you can imagine, the shock from these police officers are just like, so then that evening, the plastic bags were removed from Cranley Garden and was taken to Hornsey Mortuary. So this part is quite heavy, guys. One bag was also found to contain two dissected torsos, one of which had been vertically dissected, and a shopping bag containing various internal organs. The second bag contained a human skull, which was pretty much clear of skin, a severed head and a torso, where the arms were attached but the hands were missing. I just can't even deal. I can't. An interview was then conducted with Dennis on the 10th of February. Des confessed that there were more human remains in his flat. There was a human remain stuffed in his chest of drawers in his living room and inside an upturned drawer in his bathroom. The dismembered body parts were all from three different men and they were able to tell that all three men were killed by strangulation. He then also admitted that he had killed approximately 12 to 13 men in his old previous address. 195 Melrose Avenue, and that was in December 1978. He then also admitted to have unsuccessfully attempted to kill about seven other people who had either escaped or one particular person, one particular occasion, had been at the brink of death and then he resuscitated this person and let him leave. So this man has been extremely busy. So with that in mind, a further investigation took place to uncover the rest of the bodies and the rest of the remains from Cranley Gardens were collected on the 10th of February. In the bathroom, the torso and legs were found and a skull, a section of a torso and various other body parts found in the tea chest. That same day, Des accompanied police officers to his old address to uncover the other supposed parent bodies. And he indicated three locations in the garden where he had buried the remains. So basically under English law, if you're not familiar with it, you can't keep someone in custody unless you're gonna charge them. And you can only keep them for approximately 48 hours and then you have to let them go if you've got, if you've got nothing to charge them against. So with that, they assembled the remains of the victims they killed at Cranley Gardens. They put them on the floor of Hornsey Mortuary and Professor Bowen was able to confirm the fingerprints on one of the bodies match those on file to a missing person called Stephen Sinclair. So at 5.40pm, Nelson was charged with Sinclair's murder. And with that, obviously, the police then had to submit a statement to the press because everyone was wondering what the hell was going on. You're probably wondering what the hell I'm doing, don't worry. There's methods to my madness. So I just want to say the next part if you hadn't realised it's getting a bit heavy, but the next part is particularly heavy. You are more than welcome, obviously, to skip if you feel that you need to. So the police then did some questioning, obviously, with Des to figure out why. Obviously, the main question everyone's wondering. And he simply said, I'm hoping you'll tell me that. Like, that's terrifying. That would absolutely freak me the fuck out. He was adamant that his decision to kill was not made until the very moment that the act took place and that he didn't really consider taking someone home and that that was the plan all along. So several of his victims died of strangulation 
or if it wasn't strangulation, they would have been drowned. Typically, once the victim had been killed, he would typically bathe the victim, shave any hair from the torso, so it didn't have like a physical, personal appearance anymore. Then he would apply makeup to any blemishes of the skin, and their body was usually dressed in socks and underpants before Nilsson draped the victims around him and would talk to them. So, this guy, man, he is heavy to say the least. And he's the fact that he's so willingly talking about it as well really creeps me out. So, as we sort of assumed was going to happen, he would also masturbate. Oh, I'm finding this so awkward to talk about. But he then would confess that he would never actually penetrate or have like actual sex with his victims. He would say that they were too perfect and beautiful to be pathetically ruined by a, some form of common sex. Like it wasn't, it's, it was more to him than that, if that makes sense. So in several instances, he said he would talk to the victims' bodies as well, and he would sort of keep them and seat them in an armchair while they're watching TV, like have something to talk about. And he would recall being so marvelled by their bodies, just the way they looked. With reference, he actually said about one of his victims, Kenneth Ockenden, Des noted that Ockenden's body and skin was beautiful, like he used those words, adding that the sight almost brought him to tears of seeing his body, it was just so like, magnificent to him. So once again, this next bit is heavy as well. The victims killed at his previous address, Melrose Avenue, were kept for a really long time, um, for as long as decomposition would allow. And if a body didn't show any fast signs of decomposition, he would occasionally keep it beneath the floorboards and retrieve it before having sexual situations with it. Like, yeah. And then he said he would apply makeup to them to enhance its appearance and obscure any blemishes. So it was as if it was more like a something to marvel at and to be appreciative of rather than the destruction of them. Which I, that part for me is fascinating, but the whole thing is fucked. Once again, heavy. So all the bodies of the victims from Melrose Avenue, his previous address, were dismembered after several weeks under the floorboards. Des recalled that the decomposition of these victims made the dismembering part very, very difficult for him. Really? Funny. I wouldn't expect that to be easy for anyone, to be honest. He recalled having to calm his nerves by whenever he had to dismember a body, he would have to get drunk on whiskey first to be able to get himself together to be able to do it. He said he'd have to also grab like a handful of salt to like get rid of the maggots and stuff. Like this guy was just so open to all of this. He was quite happy to discuss it, which just baffles me. He often said he would vomit, no shit, cause what you're doing is disgusting. And then he'd wrap the dismembered limbs of the body in plastic bags, put them onto a bonfire in the back garden. <sighs> So when the police then questioned him on like, did he actually feel bad for doing any of this because of the way he was talking, like did he have any form of remorse at all? He then come back with, and I quote, I wish I could stop, but I couldn't. I had no other thrill or happiness. He said he actually took no pleasure in the actual killing part of the act, but, and I quote, worship the art and act of death. Sorry, is that supposed to make it better? I'm confused. So, with all this knowledge, Des was brought to trial eventually. It took them a long time to obviously find all the evidence and the names of enough people to obviously do that. I will obviously go through all that later, but for now, I just wanted to get the main story down. So he was brought to trial in on the 24th of October, 1983, and he was charged with six counts of murder and two of attempted murder. He was tried at the Old Bailey before the judge and pleaded this, this got me. Pleaded not guilty to any of the charges. Sorry, how on earth can you admit all this and then come forward and say you're not guilty? I just can't, I can't understand how his brain works at all. So obviously the investigators were also extremely shocked that he decided he was not guilty. And when asked why, it was basically to do with how sound of mind he was. 
So, this is what the whole dispute was about. The prosecuting counsellor, Alan Green, argued that Nilsson was very sane, knew exactly what he was doing, and was in full control of his actions, therefore he should have been charged with murder of all accounts, and that the killings were premeditated. Whereas the defence decided that actually, Nilsson suffered from diminished responsibility, making him incapable of making these decisions himself, and therefore not being sound of mind at the time, that would mean that he would only get charged for manslaughter, not murder. So if you're not sure, the difference is that murder, you've obviously thought about it, you knew you were going to do it, it was premeditated, you would then get the usual sentences jailed for life, or in some um, US states you can get the death penalty. Obviously we don't have the death penalty in the UK, so it would just be life. Whereas with manslaughter, just get approximately usually 15 years in a psychiatric hospital where you're obviously mentally healed and then you can then go out into society again. So a lot of people did not want the latter for Dennis, um, especially the police. You know, the last thing he wanted is this man being able to walk free again after admitting all of this. He's a piece of shit, to be honest. So I'm with them on that one. I would have been pretty pissed off too, especially after he admits everything. It's supposed to be snow. I'm going to do another heart here, and I'm going to do some gingerbread men, but I'm going to have to turn you off because I can't concentrate, and I'll come back. Hello! Look! How cute! I just, you can tell I needed to do that off camera so I could actually focus. So the trial was going after two witness testimonies and two psychiatric evaluations and a lot of toing and froing between prosecution and prosecution and defence. The jury retired to decide upon their verdict. On the 4th of November 1983, the jury returned with a majority verdict of guilty upon six counts of murder and one of attempted murder. And then the other count of murder was a unanimous vote of guilty. So the relief that the prosecution, Detective Inspector J must be feeling. I can't even imagine. Thank God. And with that, the judge then the judge then sentenced Nielsen to 25 years without the possibility of parole. Thank God. So in the years following his incarceration, Nielsen composed a 400 page autobiography entitled The History of the Drowning Boy. And he ended up giving this book to someone he really trusted um, and it still remains in the possession of that person. He likes to describe in it the difference between his real life and his fantasy life. I'm assuming that that's how he decided to get his head around what he was doing. Who knows? Nielsen then became known as the Muswell Hill murderer and he died at York Hospital on the 12th of May 2018. He had a, he was having surgery to repair his abdominal aortic aneurysm but he hemorrhaged and died so he is no longer with us, thank God. But that is essentially the story of Dennis Nielsen. Heavy, hey? So I want to just quickly talk about his victims as well. I won't go into complete history of his victims. I do want to mention their names as I feel like it's important to give them the justice that they need. I am also going to mention the unidentified victims, which unfortunately we're unable to put a name to, which is just horrific. So, the first victim was in 1978, Stephen Dean Holmes, who was 14, and he died on the 30th of December. Then in 1979, 3rd of December, was Kenneth Ockenden, who was 23. In 1980, 17th of May, Martin Duffy, who was 16. 20th of August that same year, William Sutherland, who was 26. September, there was an unidentified man, and also in October and November. There was also another in November, December as well that was unidentified but however Nielsen then did claim that this victim was actually made up and not true. Then in 1981, 4th of January, there was an unidentified male victim, as well as February and April as well. Nielsen also claimed that this victim was not real, and actually he made that up too. 18th of December that same year, Malcolm Barlow, who was 23. In 1982, John Howlett, who was 23. That was in March of that year. And in September of that year, Graham Allen, who was 27. In 1983, 26th of January, Stephen Sinclair, and that was his first victim. So. I just want to quickly say as well, the police officers 
Detective Inspector J. I just can't even understand how they managed to keep themselves together throughout all this. Like, what a case to just get thrown on your desk, you know what I mean? Like, and they were so determined to find all of those victims and well, as well and couldn't. It's just so horrible and disheartening and I feel so sorry for them. I can't imagine the mental strain that that puts you on having to work on a case like that. But this particular case of Dennis Nilsson really fascinates me and him, it's just like, he's, he's mental, he's mental, he's actually insane. Um, luckily he's not on this earth anymore and we won't have to deal with him ever again. Um, I will leave obviously all of the sources down below. This was a heavy one but I feel like it needed to be spoken about and it was really important to me so I wanted to bring it up. But to bring the happiness back of Christmas, look at my face. How Christmassy. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you like this video, please give it a big thumbs up. Any questions or anything, please write it into the comments. I'd love to hear your opinion on Des. And please go and watch the ITV documentary series. It's so good. Guys, thanks so much for watching. Have an amazing Christmas and I will see you next week.